Titus chapter 1. Now we're going to see what this topic of aggressive grace. Aggressive grace. And um, the main verse for aggressive grace is Titus 2, 11 and 12. And let me just explain that briefly. Can I do that? Yeah. Before I go into some of these. Well, let me show you some other things first, which I was going to do. And I will go to Titus 2, 11 and 12 after. All right, let's look at... You remember the three main problems of the Cretans, okay? In Crete, he said they are always liars, which means they do not receive truth. Doesn't mean that they're like walking around lying about everything. Maybe they just don't receive truth, okay? So that makes them living a lie. Number two, they were evil beasts. That's pretty interesting to say about some people. They were, they were infectiously evil and they were acting like something other than human beings. Evil beasts. And then they said they were slow bellies. I didn't say shabelly, I said slow bellies. <laughs> Please. Slow bellies meant they were lazy and unruly. They were passive. Wow, thanks for that mission feel. They are liars, evil beasts, and they're lazy and unruly. What a great mission feel that is, huh? Would you like to be dropped into that one by God? You're like, wow. You know, some, some places I can tell you that are like that. And... Uh, Evil beast. Infectious evil. I mean, what is, what is evil? The opposite of the goodness of God. Evil is something that is derived from Satan. So here's some things that are said about these people. Verse 11. Now, we're not talking about we're talking about also the circum verse 10, sorry, the circumcision. And there's the Jews that are there, but there's also the Cretans themselves. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. <laughs> this is the word epistomizo. It means to shut their mouths with a muzzle. Epi. E-P-I, stomizo, to stop their mouths. Paul says you better stop their mouths. Epi, stomizo, E-P-I-S-T-O-M-I-Z-O, epi, stomizo. It means to shut their mouths, muzzle them, and curb their talking. Whose mouths must be stopped. Now you've got to be pretty, you know, like... <laughs> Here we go. I'm sending you into this church, and this is what you're going to have to do. I'm sending you to these people. You're going to have to stop, their, muzzle their mouths. <laughs> now, we, we are like, I, mean, I don't know, because maybe you haven't been exposed to a lot of churches, but there's some very interesting places where I have been, and you really wish you could just do this, muzzle people's mouths, you know, stop their mouths. <laughs> But Paul says to Titus, you've got to do this. Now look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, speak sound doctrine. What I'm getting at here is that here's some of these verses that show us that his grace must be aggressive. Speak sound doctrine. Don't just stand there and listen. Don't just take a public opinion poll, but you need to speak sound doctrine. Are you with me? Verse 6. In verse 9, he uses the word exhort people. Exhort them. Now this means in this context to really bring in an encouragement that will help them. And we said before, it's the same word parakaleo, comfort them. But exhort them. He says it twice. They need to be exhorted. You can't just sit by and let things happen in Crete. You've got to do something. You've got to go in there with a plan and the leading of God and really uh, just say this is, this is what's going on here. All right, and so I think uh, if somebody is just, well, I'm just going to pray, and uh, you know, I don't want to address anything right away, and uh, whatnot. If God tells you to be patient and not say anything, that's fine. But if God is telling him through the apostle Paul to exhort people, then he needs to do it. Now, verse 12, 
The word teaching is actually training. That's why it's aggressive. It's not just teaching people, but grace should train people. Teaching is one thing. Training is another. Train them. And what are you supposed to train them to do? Well, we'll see that later on. Okay? Well, I'll look at that later. But three things. To deny. Things to deny. How to live. And what to look for. Okay? But training them. Number, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Let's read that verse. It's quite a verse. These things speak, exhort, and, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Speak, exhort. It's the Bible. Is this the Bible or not? Yes. Am I reading what you're reading? Yes. Okay. Speak, exhort, and rebuke with what? All authority. And this, this is the word. Let me, let me give you first what the word rebuke is. Because we've already talked about exhort. Rebuke is elegeko. E-L-E-G-C-H-O. 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 Everybody got it? It's awesome. And it means to show somebody they're wrong. To convict them. To repudiate what they're doing. Repudiate it. Reprove them. So it's to show them they're wrong. To convict them. To reprove them to repudiate them and to admonish them. And he says do it with all what? All authority. Rebuke with all authority. That doesn't mean you walk around and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. Just talking about like him going to people one-on-one -on -one, or maybe he's in uh, an assembly and he's got to say some things in an assembly that people do not want to hear. You think any pastor wants to get up and talk about pornography, adultery, drinking, drugs, prescription medicine, relationships that are ungodly? Nobody wants to do that. I mean, wouldn't it be great never have to never have to mention that? Wouldn't that be great? Sure, it would, but it wouldn't be godly. It would be great, but it wouldn't be godly. Nobody wants to do that. It's like, oh, I can't wait to go to church so I can just like hammer everybody. No. I think that basically you heard Sunday morning's message, cast your cares, and then this is who I am at night. You know, there's no, there's, I don't think anybody got hammered, did they? Unless they were one of those things they were not supposed to be. So he says, rebuke with all authority. Now listen to this word authority, epitage, E-P-I-T-A-G-E. This is an interesting word. E-P-I-T-A-G-E. Rebuke with all authority. And this means with a strong charge so you arrange them in the correct order. <coughs> Epitagi means, E-P-I-T-A-G-E, -E, it means a very strong and severe charge so they might come back into order. Strong and severe charge that they might come back into order. All right? Why is it that I always see you with women and you're never with other men? Are you trying to disciple women? I've had to say that to people. Like I never see you with anybody. Do you disciple anybody? No? Oh, I'm discipling those two girls. Oh, really? <laughs> That's so interesting to me. Well, knock it off. Some of you ladies don't get discipled by men. You don't get discipled by men. You get discipled by the pulpit, pastor from the pulpit in preaching, and by older women who have spiritual life. Okay? Ah, I thought I'd call you up tonight. Maybe we could go out to... to uh, McDonald's, I don't even know why I mentioned that name. Forget that place. Friendly's, no, I don't know if that's around here at all. Uh, definitely not Starbucks, that's demonic. Um, no, 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 it's okay. I, I'm going to Bible class. Yeah, but oh, you know, we can, we can miss a class. You know, no, we can't. Ha ha. No, I'm not. Mm. No, I'm not. So, speak, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Next, chapter 3, verse 1. He says, put things in people's minds. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and to obey man magistrates, 
to be ready to every good work. You've got to put things in people's minds. See, listen, when, when somebody's preaching or somebody's teaching Bible school, maybe most people are fine with whatever you're saying, even though it's something strong. But there might be three, four, five, ten people that maybe it's very important for them to hear that. Because they're just passive. They're, they are lazy. They are not uh, people that really are walking in the light. They're not walking in the same steps, in the same faith. But you, you know, take it like, you know, we can't say that. that just because it's not you doesn't mean it's not somebody else. Isn't that true? Very important. Put it in people's minds. We put things in people's minds. Prayer is important. Loving in the body is important. The finished work is important. Casting your cares upon God is important. Walking with God is important. Dressing right is important. Not drinking is important. Not using narcotics is important. Uh, watching too much TV is crazy. You know, being on your iPod and computer all day till you're blind in your face. Nobody can even figure out what your name is anymore because your eyeballs are backwards. <laughs> it's important. It's important. Do you ever just sit down in your room with your Bible? Just sit there. Try it sometime. Just sit in your room for like an hour. Try it. You ever try that? Shut all things off. Pull the shades down and sit there in your room and just blow your nose. <laughs> oh. I got a cold. My wife says, I'm, I'm in the, my wife says, I'm going to the next room because you're unbearable. You're unbearable when you're not sick. But when you're sick, you're just walking around all the time. I said, I, I need exercise at night. What the heck am I going to do? Just walk around. Walk around. Check out the rug. See if everything's lined up. Make sure the pillows are in the right place on the couch. Go downstairs. See if the trash is okay. Go, go, to, go outside. Look around in the dark. Yeah. Especially in the, yeah, just look around, and sit on the porch, play with the bunnies. I got bunnies in my backyard, lots of them. Tons of bunnies, give them lettuce. No, just like try some, I mean really quiet time is so awesome. Quiet time, just, just not, not just taking a walk, because you know, there's so much that comes at the eye gate, isn't there? Even if you're sitting, you're taking a walk or something like that, but really just in a, in a room where like there's no sound. My wife really honors that. Like, she'll, she'll turn the water on. I said, why did you turn the water on so loudly? <laughs> no noise. I do that to Anna Joy. She gets a little provoked. Anna Joy, now pick that up or you're going to have quiet time. I don't want quiet time. <laughs> you need that's good. I think it's like, imagine if, ch if parents took their children and spent quiet time with them. Just sit on, the child sits on your lap and you just read to them. Just read. You know? A lot of parents think they've got to like, you know, put the kid in front of the machine so they can watch, even if it's a biblical story. You know, that, that might be, that's better than anything else. But be careful because they get used to being acted upon instead of doing the action. Like reading or doing something. Whatever happened to kids playing? Don't kids play anymore? Huh? Do they actually play? Like go out, I mean, when I was a kid, I would go out and I would kill birds <laughs> with slingshots. I would shoot rats with a small pistol. And I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would go into people's garages and break their locks off and get into their garage and take, look, and do everything, get on their machines and ride them and, you know, I mean, I play. We, every day. <laughs> well, that's not really play, but that was like my kind of play, you know? No, we would play baseball in the streets. You know, the streets were like very safe. There wasn't 8,000 cars on one street and people were driving like maniacs. You go out and play baseball in the street. I, I had a basketball court in front of my house. On the, dri the driver was like this and there was, I had a, a hoop there. And I played when there was snow on the ground. No, we just we played. We just did stuff. We never had a. T there was no television, let alone a phone or a computer. There's nothing. We just played. We had fun. We talked. You know, you go to Africa. Isn't this true? Everybody talks to everybody because these things don't exist. So you communicate with humans. Wow, <laughs> human beings. Not really humans. You get to talk. 
Hey, how's it going? Well, just say, I don't understand the English language anymore. I've been watching so many computer things, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. It's going so fast, my mind doesn't even able to understand anything that's going on. What do you say? I don't know what you say. Oh. <laughs> put it in their mind, right? Titus, put things in their mind. Put it in their mind. By the way, it sounds, you know, somebody said to me one time, like, why do you always keep saying the same thing over and over in a message? Because I said, you're not smart enough to get it. <laughs> right? That's why, because you don't get it. So I'll say it a hundred times, if I, right? You ought to hear me in Africa. You think, I'm, I'm ballistic over there. I'm out of my mind. Like here, I'm very calm. I'm very calm here when I preach. In Africa, I, I throw chickens around. Uh, then the message, I fire, th I mean, it's, no, it's wild. And they love it, right? People love it. I mean, I get, you get the amens and the hallelujahs, and you got a real thing going there. It's, it's wild. Huh? Yeah, I mean, really, like, you know, I got to be a little bit like, you know, tomatoes? No. No. There's been eggs and stuff like that. <laughs> Put it in their mind. Verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that you affirm constantly. How often should you affirm it? Constantly. See, you see, he's so aggressive. Put it in their minds. Affirm it constantly. Look at verse 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject him. Ha! Oh, man! What are, you, what are you talking about? Reject him. Paul is saying, like, you know what? You need to be aggressive. In this situation, you've got, here's the Cretans, right? Liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Here's the Jews of the circumcision, right? They're out of their minds, right? Here's the heretics. You've got all kinds of things you're facing. And I, you see that in many, many places you go to. Wow, you've got, you got the Cretans over here, evil beasts, liars, slow bellies. Then you got the heretics. Then you got the legalistic people. Then you got the Pentecostal fanatics who have to speak in tongues. Every time uh, you, you, you say hallelujah, they reel off tongues all over the place. You, know? you got all those people there. Then you got the women pastors and the prophets and the apostles and the, the healers. Whew. You, you got to be strong with what we believe in Africa. Not just here, but there. It's unbelievable. It's, it's incredible what you will face in a congregation. And I would tell people on, on Monday nights, remember? See the door? It's open for you. If you don't like what I'm speaking? There's the door. And people left, but more people stayed. And it's amazing. So we can see that he is really aggressive here with these, with these uh, words. Put in mind, bringing people to their remembrance. The word affirm means to assure people by firm and strong words. So he's saying this is important. This is called aggressive grace. Aggressive grace. Now, in the book of Acts, let me just give you a few verses here um, that I think that you could just study for yourself. God knows if I can find them. Yes. Because I think this really showed you how aggressive the church was. By the way, if you read Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10, you would see how aggressive Paul was in Galatia. He said, I marvel. Are you with me? You don't have to turn there. You could listen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is the, not another, but there are some who would pervert you and trouble you. And I say that let them be anathema. Okay? I'll say, he said it twice. Let them be accursed. Paul was very strong with the Galatians. He said, you've got people in there that are removing you from the grace message. Metatithemi, they're, they're removing you from the grace message. He, he called them, he says, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You've been bewitched. You've been satanically hypnotized. That's what the word means, baskiano. You've been satanically hypnotized. It's amazing. He just went right at him. By the way, Paul did not say hello in Galatians. His first, his opening line in the letter was, how'd you like to get a letter like this? Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men. That's the first words of the letter. Huh? 
He didn't say, hi, how's it going? Grace and peace be unto you. I love you, my own children of the faith. Paul, an apostle, not of men. It's in the command tense. Neither by men, but of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father. I marvel that you are so soon removed. I can't believe this happened to you. I didn't come to please people. He said, I come to please God. If I please people, I, have to, I can't persuade God of my ministry. But if I please God, I'll persuade people. So he was very strong in that. Now, Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Would you say that in that portion of Scripture that grace was aggressive? The whole house was shaken. And Peter started preaching. They had just released him from prison. And he's preaching again. He said, and it says, great grace was upon them all. Acts 4, verse 33. I'll just give you some verses to look at. Read these chapters. Acts chapter 5, was Peter aggressive in grace? Well, he wiped out Ananias and Sapphira from the church in one church meeting. Take them both out. Acts chapter 7, was Stephen aggressive when he was speaking to the council? Huh? He quoted 49 Old Testament verses in speaking to the council, the Sanhedrin. In Acts chapter 8, was Philip aggressive in Samaria? Was he aggressive? Yes, he was. The whole city got saved. How about Paul in Acts chapter 9? When he got saved, did he start preaching in Damascus? Jesus is the Son of God? Huh? He was so aggressive, they, had to, they said, you can't even come to Jerusalem. Everybody's going to kill you. He was aggressive. He was aggressive. Acts 11, 19 through 26. Paul, when he went to Antioch, was aggressive with the message. Made them a missionary church. Acts 13, 43. They continue to persuade people about the grace of God. Acts 14, 43. Acts 14, 3. A long time preaching the word of his grace. 13, 43, 14, 3. 15, 11. At the Jerusalem Council, we, we are telling you that we believe that we'll be saved by the grace of God. 15, 40. A door was opened where we were recommended by the grace of God. Look at chapter 16 in Philippi. Was he aggressive? Come out of her, right? Preaching in Philippi. Acts 17, Thessaloniki starts a riot. Acts 18, in Corinth they want to kill him. Was he aggressive? Or was he just hiding in a corner in the back of somebody's bakery doing occasional Bible study without anybody knowing it? Acts 19, what happened in Ephesus? He was right in the middle of people screaming for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians and the seven sons of Sceva. Jesus we know and Paul we know and who are you? By the way, the demons knew Paul. Jesus we know and Paul we know about. We don't know who you are. I think that's what could be said about a lot of Christians today. Jesus we know and Paul we know. Who are you? You're not even a threat to us. You're not a threat to the kingdom of darkness so we don't even bother like, acknowledging you. Because we partially own you. Hmm? He was aggressive. Acts chapter 20. How about in 22? He's facing, he's facing the Jews, the council. He faces, he faces the authorities, Agrippa, Festus, Felix. He don't care. What do you call that? Passive grace? Huh? I call it what? I call it aggressive grace. I love it. Now, just to close this class, turn back to Titus chapter 2. Maybe you never left there. Something I wanted to go through. To find it is another question. I got so many pieces of the paper up here. Ha ha! Uh, I remember in the graduation, in the um, ordination service in Uganda. What year was that? 99, yeah. That was 12 years ago. Was it that? Yeah, was it 12? I preached this message. I've never preached it since, though. But I preached the, a message on grace, a total salvation. The word that's used in Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, it's very rarely that the word salvation 
is used as a noun in the Bible. It's always a verb. It's always soteria or soteria, but it's, here it's soterion. It's a noun. It's only used as a noun in Luke 1.30 and 2.30. When Simeon and John, no, I'm sorry, Luke 2.30 and 3.6, sorry. Um, I might even be wrong about that, but it seems like that's fitting my brain. Um, somebody can check it out for me, Pastor Eugene. If, it's, if it says Luke 2.30, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. And then John the Baptist said, all eyes shall see the salvation of the Lord. And it, it's, it's talking about Christ. He is total salvation. That's when the noun is used. Talking about a person. All right? Is that, is that right, those two verses? Yeah. Now, the word soterion, a noun. This, this is what total grace is. I may have given this to you before, but I was thinking about it today. The last time I preached this message was in Uganda with um, two IVs on each arm. That's why I remember it was so provoking. I, I escaped the hospital by, through a window in a taxi cab. Yeah, it, was, it was good. It was fun. Seven things. Are you ready? Grace brings you to Jesus Christ. This is just very simple. Just something to remember, though. It's really, I, I like, I, I've always kind of like thought on this many times. Grace brings you into the body. That's number two. Grace brings you into the body. Grace will not just bring you to Christ and leave you without the body. Are you with me? Are you sure? People are funny. They got better things to do than take notes, stare off into the air. Grace brings you to Jesus Christ, into the body. Number three, grace brings you up. You grow as a disciple. I like to remember things this way. It really helps me. Grace brings you up. Number four, grace, grace brings you back. When you go astray and you fail, grace restores you. Grace brings you back. Number five, grace brings you through tests and trials. Grace brings you through. Number six, grace brings you against the enemy. And number seven, grace brings you out with the gospel. I, like, I just, those words are so easy for me. To, in, up, back, through, against, and out. To Jesus, into the body, up as I grow, back to restore me if I fail, through every trial and test, against the enemy, and out with the gospel. And then, I don't call this number eight, I just call it like a, 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 an end thing. Grace will bring you on when you go home to be with the Lord. Grace will carry you home, bring you on to heaven. So, that's total salvation. That's soterion from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings total salvation. That's what it really means there. It brings total salvation. Not just salvation, I'm saved. But grace is going to do everything for me. It's going to bring me to the body. It's going to help me to grow. It's going to restore me, bring me through trials and tests. Give me victory against the enemy. Take me out with the gospel and bring me on to heaven. That's called, I, you know what? Satan was called the light bringer. Jesus is called the grace bringer. Because Satan's light was a false light. Lucifer means light bringer. That's what it means. But Jesus is the grace bringer because grace comes with truth. That was only a, a false light. So that's aggressive grace. That's aggressive grace. That's total salvation. Now, just let's read this here. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, training us to do what? To deny ungodliness. That's, see, in other words, grace is not just here for me to get saved, but to deny ungodliness. And what else? Worldly mindset. That's, it doesn't mean just the, the six lust patterns that we think of, but it means a, a mindset of the world. Lust is epithumia, how I think. The world thinks a certain way. So grace will train us not to think like the world. Right? 
By the grace of God that bringeth salvation as the Prince of all men teaching us, training us, padia, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. So grace says, deny something. By the way, denial is not some kind of act or works of a human being from the self. Deny is actually a Greek word that means you refuse something because you have something better. Okay? In other words, you get something from God so you don't want what the world has. It's not, I don't want what the world has, now I'll get something from God. No. John 3.30, he must increase, I decrease. God does the increasing, then I decrease. I don't decrease so God can increase. That's works. He increases, I decrease. And by the way, I love how it reads in the original language. He must increase. It doesn't say I must decrease. The word must is not there. He must increase, I decrease. That's how it reads in the original. Look at the word must. You'll see it's in italics in your Bible. Am I right? Check it out if you don't believe it. In a good Bible, it's in italics. It means it's not in the original language. He must increase. I decrease. Okay, so we deny. Huh? We deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And then it teaches us we deny and then we live. We learn how to live. We, we deny ungodliness and worldly lust and we learn how to live. How do we live? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Well, if you've denied ungodliness and worldly lust, you'll know how to live in the present world, right? If I don't deny worldly lusts, how am I going to live in this present world? I'll be just like the world. So grace is going to train us to deny, train us how to live and then how to look. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is aggressive grace. Zechariah chapter 4, 6, 7, and 8. They came forth with shoutings, with the headstones shouting, grace, grace. It was aggressive grace. Ezra had aggressive grace. Nehemiah had aggressive grace. Isaiah had aggressive grace. Jeremiah stood against all the priests and prophets and rulers. He had aggressive grace. Abraham had aggressive grace. Joseph, aggressive grace. Moses, aggressive grace. Just read it. You see these men, Caleb, in Numbers, book of Numbers 13 and Joshua 14, aggressive. It means motivational, not standing still but willing to go against or into anything that maybe somebody else say, I don't think I want to do that. But this grace was motivational and aggressive, and Titus was the man. Father, thank you tonight for this class. Help us, God, to understand this class. Next week we'll look at the 12 aspects of a man of God and uh, the importance of what a man of God is and 12 principles that we see in these epistles. We thank you tonight. Bless our night. Keep us safe as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and hallelujah.